Right. Hello and welcome to my show, TikTok, where we talk about what makes people tick. We'll find out what it took for the most successful people to pursue their passions, follow their dreams, and achieve their goals. Today's guest is definitely a household name and is now probably the first name that comes to mind when you think of the words Filipino designer. Especially today, the day after another milestone in his career, last night's out-of-the-box online runway show launching his latest collection to celebrate not just his birthday, but his 26th year in the business. Please welcome Raho Laurel. Hi, Mir. Hi, Raho. So nice How are to see you. you. I'm good. You sleep, I'm you're fine. looking fresh. You sleep well. Very well, very, very well. I took a shower because it's so hot before talking to you, and I put cologne. So <laughs> at least I feel. I can smell the cologne. cologne. <laughs> are you still reeling from last night's euphoria? Uh, yeah, I mean, really, uh, what an overwhelming response to. Uh, Robbie Carmona and our endeavor to really connect and to really sort of like find a way to reach out and communicate and express uh, in the language that we know, which is fashion. So I'm, I'm right. very what, what did you hope to achieve with that show? I mean, people might argue that what is the relevance of selling fashion during these times? But I think you hope to achieve more than that. Absolutely. I mean, we come from an industry where it's all about communication. It's all always about trying to forge a community. And for the last, unfortunately, two and a half months, a lot of us have really been on ice in our homes and really um, reflecting on uh, what's next. And as we slowly begin to regain our bearings, we needed to start somewhere. And I'm very grateful that Robbie Carmona had an aha moment. Mirsa, two weeks ago, we did all of this in two weeks. Right. And uh, he called me up at 6 a.m. You know, we're early risers now. And he asked me, what are you doing for your birthday? And sabi ko, wala. Ano gagawin ko na dito? I'm here in Batangas and you know. Anyway, so he goes, this, you know, I have an idea. And he said, and ask him what? You want to have a, a, a virtual runway show? And I said, how? You know, and then he started to sort of like explain. And then this, his, his next question was, do you have a collection that hasn't been seen? And, you know, uh, we were supposed to launch our collection called Hacienda March 13. Oh. After that, the lockdown. So we really didn't have a chance to, to, to showcase it, even to share it with our clients and our friends. So it, it almost like really serendipitously, all, right. the, all, yeah. all of the things pulled together. And uh, we managed to do something that, you know, us as titos in the industry, <laughs> technolo technologically challenged as we are, managed to pull through. What were some of like the inside stories? Were there like snafus or like I mean, heart apart attack the, inducing? Apart from the, the fact that I have zero Wi-Fi here. Right. I mean, you know, we were at Zoom after party and I, I couldn't even connect. That's number one. Number two, the logistics. First, I mean, when we did the pre-production, we acted as if it was like a regular fashion show. But we realized it's a little bit different. And it taught us really a lot of things. It, it really created this sense of patience with everyone. Primarily, like for instance, when we first casted the models, obviously we had a choice of, of models. And then it became almost like a process of elimination. So the snafus really led to learnings. I mean, more than just sort of like mistakes or hurdles, we were always trying to sort of like the end goal was to present a show, like how we and Robbie do it. But with each particular hurdle, we had to sort of like find alternatives. Like for instance, we cast models, but we had to, again, the process of elimination. A, do you live in Metro Manila? If you live outside of Metro Manila, hindi namin mapapadala yung damit. B, do you have internet or Wi-Fi? Okay. C, because I wanted a little bit more of an outdoor setting to have access to, to the outside. And then, I actually, I actually uh, 
thought that you had a venue because all the locations blended into each other. So I thought you brought the models there. No, no, not at all. In fact, they did that. That's all in their homes and in their in their backyards, in their rooftops. What we did though was essentially created parameters, almost like um, windows. For instance, the time of your the way you take your videos has to be between 10 and 11. This, it's the softest light, or between two to four, because we needed to create a light that's consistent. And because we didn't, didn't, we didn't want to send lights, we didn't want to send a, a, a set, we really had to sort of like walk through all of the process of creating this seamless story. What else? Um, obviously, we wanted to protect everyone. So the clothes had to be sterilized and disinfected before going to the models. And then we had a two-page style um, guide, how to style it, the clothes. Kasi wala naman kami doon to fix. And then we had practice of how to wear it. Uh, the biggest challenge really was, of course, as you know, Mirza, you, that was your life for, for a while. You, shoes are important to me. And yes. sometimes the shoes didn't fit. So we had to sort of like, I had to sort of talk to the models. Tingnan ko lahat ng sapatos ninyo. I want to see all your shoes. Oh my gosh. Plus, I mean, that was, that was something that we needed to, to figure out. What else are this? Ah, then obviously we had to teach them how to do makeup. And, and, and some of the models were a little nervous, but my sister, Jella, who created a video tutorial to teach the girls. And of course, our Jing. Our Jing was so generous in, 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 in having a tutorial for them. And again, the process of the models testing it, showing it to us, tweaking it. So the learning really is more, more than the snafu is that it taught me and everybody in the team to be more patient, to be more understanding, to be kinder, because we really wanted to sort of like find the way to move forward. And um, Mirza, uh, Robbie and I didn't want every, but nothing was free. We, we said we're going to proceed like this was a real show. So we paid the models, we paid um, everybody doing the project because we want to find the way to again, uh, to continue somehow. Right, and it makes uh, such a strong statement and inspiration for the industry of live events, which is severely affected. And hopefully when, when they see it, they'll see all the possibilities, right? Is that what you wanted to achieve as well? Absolutely. In fact, I think we started this seed, and we always say that, is because you know, there are many kids watching out there who are far more technologically advanced than us. Yeah. And I, what, what we want to happen is for them to sort of like take the ball and run with it and, and celebrate what you can with your gadgets and your devices. I mean, you know, obviously every, it was as if every hour we were learning something new. And uh, I think that, that that sort of guided us to sort of like, you know, it, literally, um, we would be burning phone calls and Zoom Zoom meetings with the team, our, both teams, and half the time Robbie would, you know, he's very emotional. He would sort of like uh, exit because hindi niya na hindi niya press. Oh, oh my gosh! But, 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 but he's very passionate that way. So, but more than that, I believe that we really managed to rally everybody together and for me right. i think that was the, the the fun part when everybody was logging on and can you imagine there was like a thousand people watching mirsa or so it's incredible and it's also a good example um for how people can come together in the most dire circumstances right and just soldier on and make yeah. things happen one one foot after the next i mean how eh? we need to start somewhere and if, if we don't do anything if we just keep on sort of like uh, waiting nothing's gonna happen so it, in a way it, it, it was a it was a nice beginning and i'm sure it will only get better because there's so many talented individuals watching there that will be getting ideas ah they should have done it this way you know right i mean in fact, they're doing so many things right now with gadgets. And the beautiful thing about being in this pandemic in our time is that we have the technology of the digital age wherein we can create things and start, you know, making dreams again. 
Right. So speaking of dreams, you're in a dream like uh, lockdown paradise. <laughs> We've been enjoying looking at all your posts, I'm, showing the beach and nature. And you I'm couldn't very, have been locked down in a better place, I think. Yeah, I'm very blessed, Nilsa. I mean, this is my happy place. I've been saving up for this for the last 15 years. And uh, we finished it last April. And funny, the sun is setting. And maybe later, just between us, I'll show you the sunset because it's, oh. it's quite glorious. Wow. And yet, uh, during lockdown, parang tulay pa rin your routine. Like, I often look forward to your inspirational <laughs> posts in so, on social media in the morning. And parang carry on lang, di ba? Did you ever have a moment where you felt down or unable to um, create? One day, uh, it was Mother's Day, and I'm very close to my mom, and I, I really couldn't, you know, I broke down because I really wanted to see her, but I couldn't, so basically you just have to, you know, I cried a bit and then try to like move, but you know, you go through waves the man of emotion, but because I'm a creature of, of habit and routine, that's why I'm able to sort of like maybe process things a little better because I have a checklist in my mind that, that, that that's what I do. Like I do my good morning post and then we're very lucky that we're able to sort of like create a routine for us here. Like we hike, we bike, we swim. So I think in many ways we're very lucky because my mental state, because we are a little bit freer and further away from all of the chaos, we're not so besieged by all of these negative narratives in your head. Right. And also, we don't have television here. Oh, we don't okay. have Wi-Fi. Right. So the news that we get is pretty filtered. So technically, all the news, all the negative fake news or whatnot doesn't really trigger us as much. If we were in Makati, then probably that would be a different story. You know, we stay in a one bedroom with, 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 with windows that doesn't really open wide. So can you imagine it, with this heat? So I mean, we're, that's why probably we're, I'm in a more productive state of mind because I'm in right. nature. So you're physically cocooned from the chaos and maybe <laughs> mentally as well, right? I mean, yeah, it takes absolutely. a certain kind of person to weed out all the... Bad yeah, juju. But, yeah, but we're all, I mean, we're all human. We have, we have that, the sadness and the anxiousness. And, you know, we, I think about my employees. I think about my, my, you know, my work, my clients, my job. I mean, you know, but it's a mindset. I think it's a mindset that you choose to sort of like figure it out because you can't do anything anyway. I right. mean, you shared that post one time that, you know, you, you begin to sort of like um, approach the problem yourself because you can't change the situation so you have to change right i remember you were in the early days of lockdown like i called you for an interview because you were one of the first uh early responders to the call to make ppes uh -huh. and you actually opened up your factory just so uh -huh. your sewers could come to work can you talk, uh -huh. tell us about that um essentially uh in the very early stage of the lockdown um we sent all our employees home However, we had around 25 employees. Because we, ha we have a dormitory in the factory in Yersa. Because of the traffic situation, we're in manufacturing. So the traffic really may cause problems with our employees. So we ended up housing them. And then we house them from Mondays to Saturdays and they go home on the weekends. Anyway, I called my sister because I saw on Instagram these doctors and our frontliners wearing trash bags. I was very alarmed. And so I called uh, my sister and said, ba tayo sa shop? Do we have anybody there? And, and, and she called up and said, yes, oh my God, you know, we have, we have people there. And through the kindness of Mitch Dulce, together with her, we were able to sort of like create uh, a system of making these non-medical grade PPEs, but PPEs nonetheless. So it was another learning curve because... How? Go ahead. I mean... I'm, I'm trained to do gowns. I'm not trained to do <laughs> surgical gowns, you know. It's a completely different, sorry, it's a completely different um, process altogether. 
Right. I kind of smiled when I learned that taffeta was a waterproof fabric that you decided to use. Yeah, and the bad. colors were very <laughs> couture, couture, couture PPEs by Rahul Laurel. Yeah. But again, that's, 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 I mean, we're very lucky because, it, you know, as you know, it's not, I'm not, it was not only I who, who did this particular endeavor. Right. So many, I mean, it just sort of like, nakakataba ng puso because we, we as Filipinos really care. You also used your uh, vast network to solicit donations, yeah. right? We raised almost 2.5 million. Wow. For the frontliners? Yes, for the frontliners. And we, we're still making, to be honest. We're still continuously making. I mean, in fact, that's what we're doing now for the past two, two and a half months. I mean, you know, who needs, uh, nobody needs really special clothes. That's why, that's why I was very excited to show the Hacienda collection because in many ways, you know, since we're slowly going out of our homes and slowly trying to sort of like take care of ourselves, because it's just that. Fashion naman is a means of expression. And we, you know, we will never stop dressing up. I mean, you know. Right. So you really believe so? Yeah, that, what, what do you mean? That, 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 that we'll never really stop dressing up. Because, you know, people have been talking about, oh, during lockdown, I realized I don't need so many clothes. You know, I'm oh. wearing the same thing over and over again. Maybe we have to rethink our well, wardrobes. I, I, I'm living... Proof of that. I, I came to my lockdown with five shirts and four shorts. And can you imagine? I, I, I had to live with that. I didn't have any clothes here. I just had you know, a pair, of, a, a pair of, of swim shorts in, in my room, in my closet. And that's all I have. But sometimes, yes, that's all you need. But there's a difference between how clothes really affect you and how it makes you feel. Because essentially, it's 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 a it's one huge way to really take care of yourself. And you know this. Yes. When you wear something beautiful and you wear something pretty, automatically your mind shifts to a, to a better place. Yes. So no, I I I, I refuse to, ad, to agree and to admit that fashion is dead. That will never be the case because just as long as you need something to protect yourself from, it will never end. That's nice to know. Speaking of your workers, you've often said in interviews that part of your raison d'etre in your career, it's you're in this not just for yourself, but also you feel a sense of responsibility for the livelihoods of over 500 workers that you have, right? Then you started with one sewer <laughs> in the basement of your Lola, and now you have over 500. Can can you tell, can you walk us through that story of starting um, out? Uh, essentially, I, you know, I really wanted to become a designer. That was, I, you know, that's what, that's what, that was one of my most clearest, clearest desires. And unfortunately, or fortunately, my, my father specifically didn't really agree to it. And me being the rebellious son, I, I, I did it slowly. I had one sewer. I had, uh, I took all my savings out. And uh, the only thing that he requested from me was to finish college. And soon after that, I started my business. In fact, even while I was in college, I was already paving my way because as you know, I was the assistant of Louis Mamengo. Right. And then I became the assistant of Pepito Albert. Parang every uh, step graduated into uh, another uh, step of, of where I wanted to be. But the, the, the reality there is that fundamentally it began to grow um, uh -huh. exponentially when my family started to help me now, when my mom started to help me and my sister started to help me. And then it made me feel more confident and comfortable just to be creative and just to rely on my strengths. You know, right. you don't have to sort of like worry about the numbers and do the inventory and do the accounting. But I still, but of course, in the beginning, you know, the designers in Manila are fabulous because they do everything from purchasing right. to, you know, all our colleagues. They're, they're one man, they're one man band. But in my case, because I had the, the, the good fortune of having my family to help me, then it became easier. And my focus really was 
our employees. I mean, it's it's frustrating because it, we have to take care of them because no one else will. I mean, can you imagine? I don't want to sound political, but it's so frustrating when you when you hear our government just saying to the pub, the private sector, "Okay, nung bahala," which is kind of why we need to be able to be responsible for those people who we are taking care of because what's all going to happen to them? Right. Uh, you mentioned your mentors, Louis Momengo and Pepito Albert. What did you learn from each of them? Oh my God, plenty. Um, or the most important thing you learned from each? Well, perhaps, okay. Uh, for, for instance, for, for Louis, it was his kindness. He was generally the, one of the, mo the most kindest uh, designers and very, very giving and very generous. And he was very talented because with Louis, it's really about clothes that people will wear. It's not too theatrical or too museum piece that people will not relate to. So he really designed for women and women feel good in their clothes. So that's what I learned from um, um, Louis Mengo. From Pepito Albert, the, the man is just a genius, but with very, uh, with terrible, um, what's it, what do you call this? He's terrible with deadlines. In fact, <laughs> hi Pepito. <laughs> it's true. Maybe because it, the, his his talent just triggers when it's already last minute. But wow, what he can do in the in the last three hours is sort of like I sat one time and the client was literally knocking on the door because she was supposed to walk down as a ninang. And, and I kid you not, Mirza, it was still naka, naka rollio pa yung tela. Wow, pang project runway. Yeah, but, yet. <laughs> but more than that, I think with Pepito, it's really his vision because it's a very, very clear vision of what he wants to express. And, you know, designers are just storytellers. We, we are purveyors of dreams. We are, we are wizards of fantasy. And that's who we are. And that's why perhaps one should not stop because if you stop dreaming, then you cease to exist. So the dream started in 1993 officially. That's around yeah. the time <laughs> when we met. So for those who don't know, uh, for Rajo's first magazine editorial, he hired me know. to be his model. And he actually paid me. So I was very happy about that. Well, <laughs> Do you yeah. remember that shoot? I remember that shoot because you asked for the vintage shades. Oh yes, and I and kept I gave them. It to you, and I gave it to you because you liked them so much. And I was so grateful that that you know it, it turned out so well. And I remember you wore a, a chartreuse little yes. jacket and and a, and a vivid black and white print dress. Yes, and then I was also part of Rao's very first fashion show, yes. in Club in Mars, Mars, directed by Robbie Carmona. Hi, uh, Robbie. And produced by Carmina Sanchez. Uh, yes. Uh, and, gosh, we go way back. And also, I appreciate because you also wrote the very first full-length editorial of me in the Philippine Star. Oh, yes. I remember <laughs> that because I was so uh, embarrassed because my mom bought the entire stock of <laughs> newspapers in the newsstand. I was just starting out as a writer as well. So I was glad to have been part of your journey from the very start. Yeah, and you remember my old shop was in Poblacion, but it was the old house of Maxine and um, Chua. That's and, right. And um, what's the name of this, her sister? Trixie. Oh, right, right, right. Original and uh, pop kids. Yeah, correct. So uh, things really kind of like there was a turning point in your career when in 2000, your family came on board. Yes. How did that, how did that change things? And uh, how did that become better or harder? Like everybody knows that joining a family business is not easy because fam family dynamics come into play. There could be family squabbles. How did it happen and how did you make it all work? I, I, I was, yeah, I was struggling. I was really struggling that I, you know, that we, we I couldn't anymore because the, the business was growing and I obviously I couldn't handle it. And my sister, 
Denise, God bless her. I asked her. I asked her, Can, could you could you join me? Could you could you help me? And you know, she, my sister is a, uh, an educator. She's really a teacher. That's what she wanted to be to be a teacher. So in many ways, I'm very grateful to her because she gave up her dreams in order to pursue mine. And then when that happened, um, my mom stepped in to as our uh, finance officer or CFO, chief finance officer to hold uh, the purse strings of the, of the business. So I'm very, again, grateful to her because my mom's, you know, wartime baby and so very uh, frugal and very, very tight. So it became really more streamlined. And yes, there were challenges because of the family dynamics, but you know, the most important thing if you want to enter a business with your family is respect. You have to respect your boundaries and you have to respect the decisions that they make within their compartmentalized roles are respected. For instance, with my sister, she's HR and production. All right, so essentially anything, any decision that has to do with HR and production, she takes hold of. And of course I can, I can say something, but at the end of the day, it's her decision. For instance, I really like this um, assistant designer talented, brilliant, but is so millennial in the sense that, uh, you know, you know what I mean, right? Parang talented nga, pero alas, alas dos ng, ng hapon pumapaso. So even if I wanted to, to keep that person, Denise had to let him go. So those are the things. Or in my case, she would never um, step into the creative or marketing um, capacity because that's my role, creative and marketing, unless she feels that I've outstepped myself or if I ask advice. So obviously, there's a check and balance. We ask questions, we ask advice, but ultimately the decision within that particular role that you're given, you have to respect. You try not to overstep yourself because otherwise what's going to happen is just going to be going around in circles and walang mangyayari. Uh, was there ever a conflict like if Venice said, Raho, stop making weird things that people can't wear, you know? Oh, many, many times, many times. In fact, many times, you know, um, especially because I have a very, uh, a very hard-headed and I have a strong temper and I have a very sharp tongue that sometimes it's quite painful if I don't watch myself. And with my sister, uh, she tempers that. She's able to sort of like really find ways to get through to me so that it grounds me. Because of, of course I'm a dreamer, but at the same time you have to sort of like be grounded. So we found ways in order to communicate before we just shout at each other and really not sort of like get to the bottom of it. But, but we found a way and I'll share it with you. It's a really wonderful way. It, it's writing letters to each other because you're able to really process your thoughts. And the tone of letters is very different from the tone of the way you speak. So there's no way to misunderstand anything because it's written. So every time we have an argument, we just tell each other, I'll, I'll send you the email or I'll send you the letter tomorrow. Huwag tayo mag A big part of your success also is how you have made the business of House of Laurel uh, profitable and lucrative. I mean, some people have their head up, some designers have their heads up in the clouds and they're just designing for their um, dream muse, but you have diversified uh, your creation such that you have uniforms, which probably would have been unheard of for many designers in the yeah. past to even approach, but you've made a very successful business out of it and you've you've said in an interview that haute couture is just like uh a very tiny portion of the entire business how do you balance it all out um made to order is what i love to do it it's like uh i i try to explain it like an arrow it's like an arrow within a pyramid the smallest portion is the couture which drives the entire um equity of the entire brand up because this is the most high fashion. So 
this is what people photograph, this is what people get interested at. It drives the brand towards that particular spiral. Underneath that is the next level, which is the ready to wear. Those that cannot afford the made to order get this, it's the aspiration. And finally, the main chunk or the main foundation of the entire business really is the uniform contracts. Why? Because we are able to control the volume and we're able to manage it because of its size. The, the contracts with uniforms can last you about between six months to three years. So as a, as a business person, you can actually maneuver your way because you have that three year solid plan. Unfortunately, with made to order, it's almost like a blessing. It's almost like, a, I always say, it's, a, it's like catching a cold. You never know uh, who's going to come into your door because it's always sort of like very inconsistent. It's the consistency of uniforms and ready-to-wear that I guess, I guess pushes the brand higher and strengthens the house. So in many ways, that's the philosophy of uh, why haute couture or made-to-order is very special, but at the same time, it's not the most profit, but it is the most um, visually captivating Right, and it, and every aspect of the pyramid is essential, right, uh -huh. for it to for succeed it to grow. Yeah. as a whole. Uh, one factor or one uh, benchmark for many for the success of a designer is international fame, whether warranted or not. Mm -hmm. Right, and you uh, tried to do that by trying it out in New York, and I think you still show in Paris. Yeah. Uh, where are you now in terms of trying to go global? Um, you know, we, we it's, a, it's such a big and massive world out there that sometimes it's daunting. And, and you just, it's a process that you just keep on trying and trying and trying. It's a lot of it is preparation and of course, a lot of luck. But I think, can you imagine because the entire fashion community, the world fashion community is on a standstill. I'm thinking in my head, and I was talking to my sister about it, well, we're all on equal footing. Because even Marc Jacobs, well, 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 collection. So essentially, because this pandemic happened, I'm kind of like thinking, hmm, maybe we should sort of like try again. And because we can communicate now without the normal sort of like preconceived tools of the trade, let's say the, the publications, we have our phones, our computers, we are able to really connect with each other and find a way to really um, get our message and our brand across. So I'm still hopeful that this, that part of our business is going to grow. But to be honest, it's very, very difficult because there's so much noise out there. So many people are doing clothes. So it's it's to get into your to a door, there's a lot of um, steps. But maybe, maybe because of this particular pandemic, people are people are um, have more time to look on, on their phones and to discover us uh, talented designers here in the Philippines and here in the region. So maybe. Or also maybe it's also time to redefine what success means, right? Like if you were what are really uh, traditional ways to gauge if you're yeah. a success. It's not just because the world has shrunk into our phones. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, maybe maybe also because I'm, I'm you know, we're getting at an age we're in, we're, we're more, um, we're wiser, we're more practical and more pragmatic. I, I see it differently, and uh, I see, I see a lot of myself. I mean, uh, uh, there's a sense of not complacency but contentment. That, right. that, 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 that the imaginary rat race in my head is, is just that. It's an imaginary rat race. So I, I, I read somewhere recently, in fact, that's my good morning post for tomorrow, is that we should measure our success not by competition, but by collaboration. True. And you also uh, have said that for you, the most fulfilling part of what you do is the customer satisfaction. Oh, yeah. And you said that you always have a mission for the customer. What is that mission? And well, you see, in, in the Philippine context, uh, 
you we create these special dresses for specific occasions. Uh, and in my head, I really get to the root of why uh, this particular client comes to you. I mean, they, you, you have to get into their head space. You know, I mean, as a designer, you're not only a dressmaker, you have to be part, like a hairdresser. You have to be an, an, an analyst, you have to be a therapist, you have to sort of like boost their ego, their morale, make them confident. But bottom line is figure it out what that trigger is. And then you're going to be quite successful because you make them feel really good about themselves. For instance, early on in my career, when my girlfriends would sort of like be dumped by their boyfriends and they'd be going to the same event, um, we would make dresses in, in, and we, we'd laugh about it because it was called Operation Cise. <laughs> So we would really, we really, 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 now, now that we're older, my friends have sort of like, some of them have separated and divorced their husbands, but we live in the same small circle. So again, they come to me, my ex-husband is going to be there. I really want to sort of like make sure I'm beautiful because, you know, I am beautiful. So that's another operation uh, mission dress. So we have these little parang underlying um objectives and goals when we create this. It's not only just because you want to look beautiful, but we have certain things. For instance, I have a client. Her only objective is, kailangan mapansin ako, ha? Kailangan, <laughs> you know? And they say that outright. May goal yung ano, yeah, well, shot. In the beginning, you, you have to, you have to, as a designer, you have to draw that out. Because, syempre, it's a, you don't, if you're a new client, you, you, you don't share that. You're not that, comfortable. But as you grow and, and develop a relationship, and that's why it's so important because you, I end up having deep and really nice relationships with my clients because you get to the psyche of why it works. And that's how you sort of like develop loyal clients because it's not the dress, it's how you make them feel. It's how when you sort of like zip them, them up and when they're out of your shop, ready na sila. Either ready na sila to make um, taray some friend or ready na sila to sort of like make their ex-husband jealous or ready, ready na sila to sort of like get, uh, get the job done. You know what I mean? So it's really fashion as armor. Absolutely. For you. Without the uh, shop, another edge that you have uh, in the landscape is your marketing smarts. And of course, part and parcel of that now is your social media um, abilities. I mean, you are everywhere and relentless in updating and informing. Uh, your I, I tweeted uh, <laughs> this interview, and then there you were also in Twitter. And I'm having a hard time just grappling with all the platforms. You, um, how should I, how should I put? I always find myself, because. I mean, to all the, to all people who are watching, especially the young designers, they know this. Eh? Out of sight, out of mind. And Tim Yap taught me that. And you need to sort of like be in a constant, um, constant, basically, you need to be seen or heard so that right. you, you're, you're, you're top of mind. And that's, that's how you, you, we, we exist. Because if you're not seeing it, you can forget it. So second nature na yan for you. Do you ever get FOMO? Like, oh my God, oh my God, this is what's happening now. Should I be in TikTok? Should I be dancing on TikTok? <laughs> no, not, 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 not. No, you know what? Maybe when I was younger, but now I choose my battles and I choose really how I approach things. Is there an opposite of FOMO? The, 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 there's opposite of the joy of Jomo. missing out. Huh? Jomo, joy of Jomo. missing out. Yeah, mas gusto ko yon ngayon. Ngayon, Jomo. <laughs> Pero, even if you're Jomoing, you're still, you still have to be there in a way. Right. Because you, you have to realize, negosyo pa rin to eh. It's right. not just sort of like a, um, something that you can sweep under the floor and, and figure it out. No, we, you, we, we, we need, we need, I mean, this is a family business. I still, we still have to find ways to educate my nephews and nieces. Uh, pay our rent, uh, pay our employees. So we, it, it's it's a, it's almost like a calculated move because we have a lot of people to take care of. Yes, and we haven't really let go of anyone, huh? Up oh, to wow. now, we, wow. we, we, we've managed to to figure a way to to 
again, um, take care of our people. Hats off to you. So, of course, with great visibility comes great controversy. And you're yeah. no stranger to controversy. You've had your fair share of yes. mga copycat controversies. Yeah. How, do you, how do you deal with it all and manage to navigate a world like that? With humility and with, um, with great learning, you basically really go with the punches. You can't go on with your life without learning tough lessons and tough um, medicine, so to speak. So it was really a, it was a, it was a, how shall I say? It was almost like an awakening of sorts. Every time that happens, you become aware that I, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have reacted that way. Or, or if in fact, react in a way that's just very you. But I think really the biggest thing that I, I, I learned from that is surround yourself with the people who really love you. This world is not a kind one, Mirza. Right. Especially in our industry when everything, everybody is just trying to pull everybody down because they also want a piece of that pie. And I think that's the great realization of our lockdown is that that imaginary pie is an imaginary pie because everybody will have a piece of the pie, regardless of how big or how small the desire you are. And I think it, it just all boils to the greater understanding of being human and being kind and, and understanding that um, as a person, I make mistakes. Right. So you apologize, you mend your ways, you learn from your mistakes. And Hopefully, because it, it, you know, when mistakes are very painful, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to go back to that space because you made a mistake. Right. And maybe just for the benefit of those who don't understand in art or fashion, where do you, how do you draw the line between when they say, uh, this is a copy of this, how do you delineate? Like, is it inspiration? Is it? Adaptation? Is it plagiarism? It's different. It's different. It's very difficult to place when it's sort of like in fashion. Because even if the context is already there, but you change the position of the button or, or even just add an inch to the lapel, that's already considered in copyright laws different. But of course, you know, it's like a cyclical, wonderful process of everybody inspiring one another. It's like there's a zeitgeist in the air taking us to a direction of, let's say, naturalism, or right now, very um, internal. This, that's sort of like the feeling. Because we are all in the same world. We all live in the same community. And we basically move around in that particular wave of inspiration. So when it comes to that, obviously, it was unintentional because we actually watch the same movies, read the same books look at the same magazines, listen to the same music. So in many ways, it's very interesting. Right. And it's just another means of expression. So sometimes there's like a collective consciousness. Yeah. And we don't know like... like when, remember when everybody had to return to the 80s? Yes. What did Coco Chanel say? There's no such thing as... Original. Anything, original or... I don't remember the quote. That. But For example... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, you gave me that book on Coco Chanel. So I, yes. I, 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 I read it. So, yeah, and she's, she's one of the ori original thinkers. And I think it's that um, kind of mindset that we need to cultivate. But at the same time, we also need to be, again, pragmatic and reactionary to the given situation. Because, for instance, if you really want to exist, you can't sort of like say, I, I'm not going to do, um, for instance, I'm not going to do that. You know, remember that, that really silly um, trend when they wore leggings again? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, everybody was sort of like doing that. And I couldn't take myself to do it. But at the same <laughs> time, I, I, for, for one single minute, hmm, should I do it para lang may benta? Right. 
How do you know when to join the bandwagon and when to like I listen to pick your gut. battles? Uh, yeah, I pick my I, I listen to my gut, but I really sort of like can't stomach it. <laughs> I, I won't nala. So for example, uh that the virtual fashion show, people might say, Oh, it was actually Karine Reitfeld's CR runway in collaboration with YouTube, right? When they did this. Mm-hmm models uh, doing the catwalk at home, but they're wearing their own clothes. But you took it to another level and actually launched your own collection and made it your own. Yeah, I mean, perhaps that's, the, that's again, uh, a way to communicate and a way to sort of like add on because that's how it goes. You basically build from what you know and from what you see. And of course, because this world is so connected, that original thought grows into something that's more attuned to yourself and more attuned to your customer base and to those clients who reach out to you. Right. How do you keep evolving after almost three decades? Like every Rahul Laurel show is experiential. There's always some twist or some exciting, thrilling new facet to it. Um, How do you keep one of my techniques really is to, to surround myself with young people and just be interested and just be and remain remain interested and, and, and uh, open. Like for instance, I think um, although I, I draw the line on TikTok, I, 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 <laughs> only your TikTok, not that. <laughs> yes. Uh, I draw the line on, on some things, but. Like, like with I, 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 I akin it to to cuisine and to eating. I never say no to 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 things that I might not know. I'm not, you have to try. You have to have that sense of um, adventure. That even if you fall and hit your face, at least you can pick yourself up and say, "Here, I tried it. I don't like it, but I tried it." Like you know, I, I'll share with you. In this particular lockdown, I'm very proud of my partner, Nick, because he's been trying to learn how to swim forever. But because of this lockdown, he, he, he now can swim. And he's been trying and trying and trying. And that's one of the things that one really needs to sort of like understand is you just need to, to go at it. And I know it's, 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 it sounds very idealistic, but there's truth into saying to try and try until you die or try and try until you, or until you succeed. But... In my case, I just like to try things and figure it out. If it's sort of like, I like it, then I continue. For instance, I mean, believe it or not, Mirza, I mean, 18 years ago, I didn't know how to use a computer. Wow, so I didn't know that. I, I, had, I, I hired a, a secretary to print out my emails <laughs> and dictate it to her how to answer back. Finally, Teresa Herrera goes, this is ridiculous, Rajo. You're gonna and, and we had a partnership. We were doing a clothes line in Los Angeles. And she goes, No, I'm gonna teach you how to write an email. And before you know it, I was doing blogs. I was, you know, I was I had a blog in, 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 in preview. I I became uh, attached to to social media. You, because all of these are tools, eh? it's really about how you use them. And if you stop being open to certain things, then you remain stagnant. And when you remain stagnant, that's the death of creativity. Wow. Teresa would be so proud to know that you ran an entire fashion show through your phone What's and that? can now Zoom. <laughs> God, we used, you know, can I just share with you how, how we were really literally sweating buckets yesterday? Because in order to do the show, we had three platforms. Parang ginawa namin, just to just explain to everybody the technical aspect, we had Zoom as the tech booth that transferred the information to Vimeo, which Vimeo becomes the camera, and then Facebook was the TV. So can you imagine three different platforms that they had to synchronize? And I kid you not, it was very, very challenging because we would be looking at Facebook Okay, listening to Zoom, looking in Vimeo, which had a, maybe a 10 second delay. So basically, we had to sort of like really figure it out, especially if you're not concentrating, 
it's like doing a task with one or two of your senses removed. Imagine, let's say, driving, but you can't hear. Or, or again, eating, but you can't see. <laughs> so it, it was a very interesting process. But I'm, I was very happy that we did it because we're learning. We're still learning. I mean, it wasn't perfect. I mean, half, halfway through, there was a glitch. You know why there was a glitch? We figured out. We didn't realize it. It was, we only expected around 500, 600 viewers. Eh. So, nung lumaki na, wow. nag, parang, it was the going... crash! <laughs> parang, parang nag-crash. Pero, it just couldn't handle the load. Right. And all on very low band, Wi-Fi bandwidth. Hello, I was... From the bukid. From the bukid. <laughs> Miraculous. So, uh, if you were to teach a master class, and I'm sure that idea is not far off, what would you teach your students? What would be the, the five basic foundational things that they need to know about becoming a successful fashion designer? Number one on top of my head is you have to know math. And mm, if, if I've you, never heard that before. If, if you don't like math, you're going to have a hard time. Primarily because every single thing that we do in the fashion world has to do with math. I'm not talking about profit. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about even creating a pattern. That's geometry. And I hated math, but I've learned to love it because it's really creating flat items and making it three-dimensional. And that takes a lot of uh, analytical mind. And apart from that, you have to, again, use that particular flat idea to the three-dimensional idea. And then you have the product. And then how are you going to sell the product? Because, again, if you just keep on creating things and nobody will actually end up buying it, you're not going to survive. And there's a difference between that particular situation. Because for me, the most painful thing is, yes, you do the most beautiful things. But if nobody ends up wearing it, it'll just end up in a museum. Something to just ogle at and to see. But clothes are meant to be worn, to meant to be enjoyed. And the way to do that is you have to make it viable. So that's one, math. The second one I have to do is really, if you can't go to school, learn how to make garments. Because there's a very big difference between an idea and making that idea come true. That's why for me, um, when I um, interview uh, assistants, I interview interns. I don't look at I don't look at their portfolio, the drawings. I look at actually bring me something you made, because if, if you can make something with your hands, you're able to really tra you're able to translate ideas into reality. So that's number two. Find a way to actually make your dreams come true by making it. In other words, naalala mo yung sinasabi ng kasabihan, wag kang puro drawing. Tama. And some, des some people think designing is puro drawing lang. Yeah, but th that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, of course, you're you some wonderful il illustrators, which is a talent in itself. Number three, realize that you actually have to find your role in the fashion world. A lot of people want to become designers, but... Behind us, behind, behind us, is a virtual army of different roles that need to be addressed. And sometimes when you want to be in the world of fashion, obviously the big idea is to become a designer. But underneath that, there's different categories, which are just as important as the designer. For instance, number one, I don't know if people actually realize the value of merchandisers. And that's so important. Merchandisers are the ones who actually communicate with the clients and the designer what the clients are looking for. So that communication is very important. And sometimes it's a very interesting role because you need to be astute into what the people are shopping. So you have roles. For instance, maybe you can be, if you like shopping, diba? For me, one of, the, one of my best purchasers was this wonderful girl because she just loved shopping online. So she would get us the best deals for Sinuled um, because she was able to find suppliers that are the best because that's her, her, her physical desire was to shop. So we, we put her in that role. 
Or there are some people who are technicians who are amazing at depth at creating pattern, patterns and, and putting things into it. And that in itself is also a very important role. So find your role into this wonderful dichotomy of the industry because not everybody can be designers. If you, you know what I mean? So that's uh, Elena Bayon. So know your math, uh, learn how to make clothes, find your role in the industry. Four is probably learn how to communicate because it's all about really trying to sort of like share your ideas. If you can't communicate well, then it's very difficult for you to transcend your concepts and your themes. And the fifth lesson, perhaps even my experience, you have to be kind. Gone are the days wherein all the designers, di ba naalala mo, Mirsa, when designer ka, ay, taray, parang, you know, oh, you're very yeah. catty and you're very like right, that. Right. I think the, 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 the strength of our designers right now, whether they're young and old, is there's really, for me, ha, there's really no competition any longer, for me, anymore, because we're there to help one another. And I think that 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 it's that learning of, of becoming of being kind strengthens the community of our designers. And regardless of how we feel about what we create, we know that we need to have a mutual respect of what we do. Because as I said, if you're thinking that you'll be running out of clients, that's not the case. There will always be clients. There will always be people who will be buying your clothes. But it's more important for you to be nice. Because in the end, that's how people will help you. Because if you're not nice, you can't help Right. Wow. Thank you for that masterclass. We should start charging. <laughs> what do you think uh, it took for you to evolve into this kind of, uh, to have this kind of mindset? Like in 26 years, how did you change inside for you to, you know, now think about giving back rather than... In the, in the beginning, it was really all about desire. You have to realize, if, can you imagine, um, because I, maybe that's, that's why I became very hungry, because I had to really work for this in the sense that, that every step of the way, my, my father, not my mom, but my father would say, no, no, you can't do it, but this is what I really wanted. So, in fact, it really created a very um, protracted relationship with my father, which we now have fixed. But because of that, that, that hurdle, that wall, I just kept on pushing and pushing forward and created that particular desire to really succeed. And then when I got there, I mean, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but, but realizing that it's not all that, Mirsa, it's not all, 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 all of the accolades, all of the um, newspapers, all of the, uh, the imagine, fanfare, yeah. imagine fanfare. That's just imaginary. This lockdown made you sort of like think, what, are you, what, what is your real purpose? What is, who, 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 who are you? And I've learned that siguro in the last maybe five years, when I turned 41, I realized that para, what, what am I here for? Because if you're just here for the applause, if you're just here for the patting of the back, then that's a different story. But if you're here for people and if you're here to really sort of like make sure that again, A, take care of your employees, B, take care of your clients. And ultimately, because it's a family business, take care of our family, make sure that we're all all right. Then it becomes a different set of priorities. So if you could uh, sum up your life's work and career and your attitude into one inspirational quote that you will post every morning. Let's say, Diba Groundhog Day ang existence natin. And if there could be only one inspirational motto that you could post I have that sums up Rahul Laurel, what would it be? Hashtag challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. <laughs> and uh, you've certainly done that. So thank you, Raho. Thank, thank you, you for such a wonderful well, interview. Everything you said uh, rings true and everything you said, I think will help 
so many people who look up to you in the fashion industry. And I'm so grateful to have been part of your journey from the very start. Thank you, Musa. And thank you for always sending me these beautiful books. Yeah. I'll show you the library that you helped me with. <laughs> books always need a good home and you yeah, are always... Yeah, in fact, you know, I was, I was, I was thinking because it's eventually, you know, when I've read it all and I think it's eventually we, we'll have to find, you and I will have to find a, a place where more people will have to enjoy it. I don't know what yet, but maybe that's going to be a, to all your listeners out there. Eventually, I want to share that. That, that library that I've accumulated and I just I don't know where yet but maybe somewhere we'll, we'll be able because there's a difference between digital and books I right, find right. I really love books so maybe help me out eventually when I turn 55 or 60 I want a, a place for all of that that's a great idea hashtag challenge accepted thank you Raho thank you Mears have a nice thank day thank you <laughs> Bye. Bye, uh, everyone. This bye is everyone. Really TikTok. What? Do I just leave? Oh, yeah. <laughs> bye. Press bye. the leave button. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay. Stay safe. You too.